I just want to say that as a publisher at HarperCollins, I feel enormously privileged to have published this book. My colleague Ajita, who worked with Kirti Ramchandra and Vivek Shanbag, who worked on the translation, has worked really hard. They all have to try and bring the original context, the original emotion, and the original politics of the language of Kannada into this English. And I hope you will agree when you read it that it really does work. I've had several meetings with Professor Anand Murthy when he was with us. They have been very different experiences. One of them was when he was the Vice Chancellor of MG University and I was a student there doing my BA in a college. My university, my degree is signed by him. That was, I think, the first year that he was the Vice Chancellor there. And then later, many conversations about hoping to publish his translations when I was at Penguin first and then later with Hub Collins. And each time what struck me was that while he wrote and published with a great deal of interest, once it was out there, and once we went to him and said, let's do this, let's do that, let's put together a selection of your writing, let's put a reader together, it seemed fairly like, um, well, if you want to do it, do it, but I've gone beyond it. I, I'm, I'm moving on, I've moved on to other things, and I'm not really interested in going back and trying to make more of what there is. It was interesting because most of the writers one meets are very interested in the other side to it, you know, bringing it out in English, making it available, and that has been so much a part of the conversation about translation and publishing in translation in India that he was always the one who stood apart from that, in my opinion at least. As I said, we are enormously privileged to do this book. I hope you will read it soon. And I'm now going to hand over to the people who are going to officially release this book here. Vivek Shanbag and Kirti Ramchandra, Professor Rajan Gurukkal, Professor Ram Guha. Will you please come up on stage and we will release the book and then we will have the conversations after. suggested that I do a translation of Professor U. R. Anantamurti's Hindutva or Hind Swaraj, my immediate reaction was no way. I hadn't translated nonfiction before. My familiarity with Professor Anantamurti's work was little, and my knowledge of Hindutva and Hind Swaraj even less. Besides, my relationship with Kannada, my father tongue, was like my relationship with him. There was awe, respect, Affection, of course, but used only when necessary. My protest was countered with the assurance that Vivek Shanbag, who I had never met or but heard of, would help me. At my first meeting with Ajita, again, someone I had only said hello to once before, and Vivek, I was won over to the idea. Ajita, with her warm smile, and Vivek, with his disarming manner and extreme courtesy, convinced me that together we could do it. I don't know if Vivek knew what he was letting himself in for, but I'm grateful that he was there. Providentially, we lived in the same neighborhood, so we could meet as often and as regularly as necessary. It took us about eight months and almost 50 sessions, lasting from an hour to several hours, not including text messages, emails, and phone calls to complete the task. Before we actually started translating, we discussed the book at length. To, uh, we tried to engage with it and find an entry point into the text. Vivek spoke as an insider who was privy to, privy to Professor Anantamurthy's personal views, opinions, and beliefs. He was sensitive to the shades, nuances, and layers of meaning of every word and phrase. I, the outsider, viewed the text with an English reader's sensibility and understanding. I asked innumerable questions, some directly connected to the text, others more general in nature. I'm sure Vivek was at times exasperated, amused, and even amazed at my queries. To his credit, he answered them all patiently, 
explained references, giving me background, especially when it came to allusions to other poets like Adiga and Devara Dasamaya. Some instances in mythology which I had heard or read differently. He made connections for me between events and incidents which I had missed and even explained simple Kannada usages which were unfamiliar to my North Karnataka years. Once I felt that I had a reasonably firm grip on the subject matter, we started the process of translation. Some days we were elated because we managed to complete a page and a half. Other days we despaired because we had barely covered a couple of paragraphs. Sometimes when I was particularly unhappy about something I had not got quite right, Vivek would calmly say, let's leave it for now. Something better will suggest itself. And sure enough, it would. Since Vivek and I trusted each other's judgment fully, it was much easier to make choices between one word and another, sentence structures and patterns. Our primary concern was to make sure we had retained the conversational tone of the, ori sorry, of the original without sounding casual or informal. Because this book was a creative response to the events of that time, it is studded with anecdotes, parables, references to mythology, and literary allusions. Many of these needed some extra reading up in order to understand the context and their aptness here. Sometimes the connections were obvious. At others, they had to be pointed out to me. The first chapter, which was in the form of sutras, had to retain that compact, aphoristic effect without appearing disjointed. Throughout the book, Professor Anantamurti creates images which are linked together even if they are not in proximity with each other. For example, the concept of kayaka. This was the most challenging part. We had to decide what words or phrases could be made self-explanatory by using adjectives. For example, the calm, sattvic face or the dark-grained, edible-looking ragi. We needed to decide what had to be paraphrased, and yet others that could not be translated and therefore retained with a note at the end. It was interesting how easily we code switched between Marathi, Hindi, Konkani, when it came to certain expressions which had exact equivalents in these languages, but made us wring our hands in frustration to transfer into English. For example, the reference to Medha Patkar and Aruna Roy, who had tucked in their sari pallus and not loosened them yet. If people don't wear saris, how would this image make any sense to them? By translating the word kayaka as toil or as work, we were conveying only a most superficial and general sense of this very profound philosophical concept. But more important was our earnest attempt to recreate for the reader the intense emotional experience we felt when we read the book in Canada. The author's anguish, his concern, his heartfelt plea to us all to be aware of the choices we make and the impact they will have on society, the world, and the earth at large had to be conveyed in a sensitive, non-judgmental, sympathetical manner because that's how Professor Anantamurti addresses us, his readers. As translators, I hope we have managed to let the voice of the author be heard loud and clear in an English he would himself have used had he written this book in English. Of course, it needed Ajita's expert eye to smoothen out all the wrinkles and creases and make it truly reader-friendly. I must say a heartfelt thank, thank you to Sharad Anantamurti, Srinivas Shastri, Bhumika Anand, Vidyulata for their support and encouragement during the process. And of course, to Team HarperCollins for everything. I come away from this lovingly done translation with a sense of fullness, as from a good meal, from all that I have learned during the close reading of the text with Vivek, and a determination to improve my acquaintance with works in other languages than English. Also, I can now unselfconsciously refer to my father as Appa. Thank you. Before I invite Professor Gurukal and Mr. Guha to speak. I, may I read a few pages from the book? How do I begin this response to the apparent optimism about Modi's election in the media and the public and my own apprehensions about it? I'm faced with a problem. 
the Nehru Gandhi family has been liberated from those flatterers who believed that only that family was fit to rule the country. We have been liberated from them too. Even as I say this, the assassinations of Indira Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi are tragedies that we must remember. Yet, when it seemed that the nation was delivered from one family, we witnessed an election campaign that resembled the presidential form of electioneering. No South Indian, Assamese, Bengali, in fact, no one from a non-Hindi speaking state could have won an election the way Modi did with his loud and rhetorical use of Hindi. A democratic agreement exists between the system essential to create a community, the institutions that preserve law and order, and courts that deliver justice. But drawing my attention to this and saying that I should accept someone who has ascended to power through a majority because it is the democratic norm is what I don't agree with. For me, providing room for those not in the majority is fundamental to democracy. Therefore, I will speak to you, ignoring those who have denigrated me nationwide for my skepticism about Modi. For the sake of convenient communication, I will present my views in the form of sutras, a set of aphorisms. I will start with the story of Job from the Old Testament. Is evil also present along with what we believe is the goodness of the divine will? In the 1950s, the visionary author and psychiatrist Carl Jung wrote Answer to Job, in which he examines what the Christian world underwent throughout its symbolic history to overcome evil. Similar to this is the Satya Harishchandra story in which Raja Harishchandra is repeatedly tested for his adherence to truth. Can knowing that good and evil are inseparable and exist together make us aware of the malevolence that might be hiding in our love of the nation? Every time the leaders of the Modi government open their mouths, they utter the words, in the national interest. That is to say, in the national interest, one can do anything, like God. We have a saying, he who gives up pride and shame is like God. Let me mention here Raskolnikov, the protagonist of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Raskolnikov aspires to be a Napoleon, an ordinary man who became a Kalapurusha, the man of the age, and acquired glory despite killing thousands in war. The young man is deeply anguished because he would never be like Napoleon, who disregarded commonly held perceptions of evil when he slew in war without guilt. Godse did not think like Raskolnikov. Through his readings of Savarkar, Godse, in his love for Bharat, truly believed that Gandhi, the advocate of nonviolence, was an impediment. Godse's final speech should be compared with Modi's fervent words of patriotism. When Godse could find no other way to put an end to Gandhi's all powerful influence in the country, he killed him. The Congress, which somehow managed to obtain nuclear friendship, with the United States, allowed Savarkar plus Modi to occupy the space vacated by Gandhi. Modi has become the true voice of the innate desire for development of the Congress, which is slightly embarrassed by memories of Gandhi. Instead of the gentle, sattvic face of Manmohan Singh, we see before us the imperious, rajasic face of Modi, in keeping with his kshatra traits. This change of face is the result of Modi's successful fueling of the middle class's obsessive greed. The face of Modi became a favorite of the media during the elections, and thousands of his fans fla uh, flaunted it as a mask. Even so, I voted for the Congress, which had given to the poor the right to information and the right to food. Throughout human history, people have accepted the victory of the victorious as inevitable. This acceptance is born out of the complacency of a comfortable life. In one of Auden's poems, the sound of a knock on the door is heard in the dead of night, somewhere in the distance. The comfort that it is far away and not on his street is short-lived. The sound of the footsteps draw nearer and his door is broken down. Thank you.